I'm not quite sure whether you want to listen to what I have to say. So anyway, uh, let me start by thanking you for your kind words, thanking you for uh, inviting me again to come here. As you say, it's six years ago. And uh, six years is usually the period of limitation after which uh, things are forgotten and forgiven. So uh, I'm entitled to return back here and make a fresh start and maybe this time get it right. Uh, but uh, your eminence, uh, your excellency, and if I may say so, dear friend, uh, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is a great pleasure, but it is also a source of surprise to see so many distinguished people coming to listen to a lecture which, at least judging by its title, uh, is a very mundane, usual thing. You've heard about the contribution of Greek thought, Greek ideas, Greek language, Greek philosophy, the love for beauty uh, to what was called, until recently at any rate, a Western civilization. Uh, and it's not the only contribution. Christianity made a great contribution, and so did Judaism, and so did, of course, Roman law. So why on earth have you come here to uh, listen to a lecture with a title that uh, is so obviously uh, obvious and known to you. And the answer is that uh, I will try to uh, give my own interpretation to why and how the Greek way of thinking, the Greek way of creating ideas, the Greek way of imagining things, uh, had such a success. It's not the only element to the amalgam, which is called Western culture, but it's a very considerable element indeed. And I think the answer uh, uh, lies in on many technical points, and if I say technical points, I'll probably put you off even more. But uh, here are some, and I think they're very intriguing, because you also find them in English culture and the English language. One is the language. The, la the language is... Um, extremely economical. Uh, if few words will do, why use many? Uh, it's not only economical, it's uh, very carefully, every word is very carefully used and veers towards an understatement. They don't like exaggerations. And I mean, uh, there's so many examples one could mention uh, from English literature, from Jane Austen to uh, Hausmann or uh, others later on in the area of uh, classics, which I'm going to discuss in greater detail, this fantastic ability to say an awful lot in a few words and say it very, very clearly. At the same time, of course, the Greeks were able to play with words, their words, which had two or three meanings, and that has confused enormously uh, English translators, excellent translators, but uh, there are some wonderful and famous statements from Oedipus Rex uh, or Antigone and so on, uh, where you will see that uh, the translation problem has really been a very considerable problem. Now, the impact of this Greek culture, the way of writing, the way of thinking, the way of shaping ideas uh, and, uh, and creating feelings is enormous. You'll be surprised that there are over 67 operatic versions of Medea. Now, uh, the fact that there are 67 versions of Medea, and you probably have heard uh, one by Cherubini or maybe another one, it uh, doesn't mean that they were successful, but it does mean that the people of the time were actually feeling obliged that they couldn't really be a proper scholar of classical Greek without having contributed their own piece about Medea, their own version, their own explanation about Medea. And I'll come back to that in a minute. <coughs> the same thing goes with Antigone. Antigone had uh, between 16... Uh, 59 and 1730 over 82 translations in English. And uh, it was a play that was performed almost non-stop and commented upon both in England and in Germany. The other thing that is absolutely amazing is Oedipus Rex, which Aristotle described as the most important of Greek tragedies, was never 
performed in England, except in schools and universities, until two, uh, 2010. Can you guess why? I want a lively audience. <laughs> I don't want you to be sitting there making me do all the work. So, uh, why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because of the office of the uh, Lord Chamberlain, who had prohibited the work on the grounds that it was indecent. Uh, because of, well, you know the story about Oedipus. So, it was prohibited. It was only performed in theatres, in theatres, in, in colleges, and in schools. And it was never performed. And just to finish this list, to give you an idea of the enormous influence, it is absolutely enormous. I've actually counted the titles of translations of various plays, Greek plays, in English, during the last 250 years, and they take up 77 printed pages in a book dealing with that subject. So, it is important, and the question is, why is it important? Now, let me start by making a few uh, simple comments. They had the great ability of writing plays which were about people who had problems and which problems are repeated from one generation to another. They were eternal problems. And the way they handled them was excellent because they didn't take sides. It is very difficult to analyze any of these great characters in ancient Greek drama and say he's good or bad, he's this, that or the other. Here is one of them, Antigone. Now, Antigone here is painted by uh, Resurrection, who is a Catholic, a devout Catholic, Filipino artist of the 1880s, 1890s, probably the most distinguished of that period. And it's a very unusual one, very good brush stroke. There, there's the hand and the body of the unburied brother. And uh, it's a wonderful, I think, painting. It's a very unusual painting because she's actually depicted not burying him, but praying. And that praying was very much in line with the line taken by many authors at the time, namely, for example, the greatest expert on Sophocles at the time, Order of the Marriage, Sir Richard Jebb, who referred to Antigone as the proto-saint example of international literature, proto-Christian example of uh, literature. Antigone. And of course that ties in well because all the dramas uh, derive uh, from various myths that go back to Neolithic times. None coincide the one with the other, but at that stage certainly taking the religious idea uh, was a very good starting point to explain the piety of the woman. But was she pious? Was she really good? For example, if you look through the play, every time she has something to say about her sister Ismini, she's absolutely beastly. She doesn't even accept the support and the help of Ismini offers her at the critical moment when the brother is to be buried. And later on, there's some controversial passages where she says, well, if it was another member of my family who had to be buried or not, I might take a different view. But as far as my brother is concerned, I must insist that he has to get a burial. Why? Why this difference? There may be reasons. Now, the other reason that makes me uh, wonder whether by the time the play was uh, staged, the Greek word was edilachi, i.e. it was uh, used as a teaching tool in the theatre, uh, which was 441 BC, uh, the other thing is that by that time, yes, by that time, the importance of belief in religion was waning. We have an excellent statement in the opening statement of uh, Clytemnestra in Aeschylus Orestia, where she appeals to Zeus, the god, and says, Zeus, whoever you are, wherever you may be, if indeed you exist at all, that's hardly a religious statement directed to the king of the gods. And that is uh, 458 BC, Aeschylus, the most conservative of the 
uh, dramatist. And you have also an even stronger statement to the same effect by Hecuba in the last and tragic anti-war play of 415 BC, which was the women of Troy, Troades. And again, you have the same thing. Zeus, if you exist, wherever you are, whatever your name is, do something because these Greeks are destroying your temples. And indeed, you have an amazing example of what? Two gods who were quarreling, Poseidon and Athena, are so furious with the Greeks because they were on one side, Athena and Poseidon on the other side, they get together and have been behaving so abysmally in destroying our temples in Troy, we're going to make their return to Greece extremely difficult. So in those arguments, can you really say that religion and piety is the basis of that play? Or do you have to find another reason to explain the character of Antigone? It doesn't matter. A play that is susceptible to different interpretations, particularly in different times, is a, a good play, a successful play. And it is a sign of the greatness of the author that he phrases things in such a way that allows multiple interpretations to take place. More importantly, multiple interpretations take place over a period of time, which means that the play can mutate, which means that the play can adapt to new circumstances, which means that the play can come into line with the mainstream, ethical stream, and aesthetic ideas of a different era. So much for that version. There's another problematic thing. You may not remember, if you haven't read the play recently, but uh, Antigone tries to bury her brother twice. <coughs> the first time, she doesn't succeed, and uh, nobody warns the king, Creon. But the second time, she's caught by his guards. And the second time, uh, the portrait we have here is by Nikiforos Litras, who, along with Gizis, was one of the two most distinguished uh, Greek painters uh, from Tinos, educated in Germany, uh, who did that uh, scene. Unfortunately, it was involved in a fire, in an accident. Nobody looked after it. So if you look at the picture very carefully, you'll see all sorts of little bubbles on it. Uh, and nobody has uh, repaired it since. And it's a very different, a very dark version. And there is Antigone throwing earth over the brother. But I repeat, why do it for a second time if it was done once? There's no religious reason to do it. If she buried him once, she covered him with dust, that should be enough. Why do it again? There's no explanation in the play. And again, it makes you wonder what is the reason. But then, one explanation, which I think deserves to be read out to you, is an explanation that the woman is not doing it out of piety. The woman is a toughie. The woman is a woman who wants to be a hero, not a heroine. She wants to be a hero in the Homeric sense. And the Homeric sense is somebody who fights in order to die, preferably young, but full of glory. Now here's a statement translated in English, but from the time, which makes out this point. And if you listen to it, I think you may begin to wonder whether it applies to her, and if it does, whether she's nice after all or not. The hero, this is an old text, translated, forgive the translation, the hero appears to others as, as, as unreasonable, deaf to appeal, self-willed. His friends and his enemies alike call him rash, thrasis, and wild, agrios, and savage, or moss, and compare him with a wild animal or an insensate object like a cliff or the sea. He does not use the art of persuasion himself. He frequently refuses to speak at all, and he is unmoved when others use them. Any attempt to teach him the Raskin is in vain. He is neither polite nor politic. 
In his lonely absorption in his own consuming purpose, he stands outside the community, he, be it the police or the army. And then he goes on citing Aristotle's politics. Is that what Antigone was? Standing aside, wanting to be different, refusing. At one stage, the chorus says, my God, you're just like your father, Oedipus, with one difference, that you haven't learned the lessons of adversity, whereas he did. And it's true, because Oedipus was involved in one adversity after the other. But at the end, he comes to terms to it, it comes to terms with it, and uh, in Oedipus in Kolonos, he is always accepted by the gods when he is allowed to be buried in a sacred place near Kolonos in Athens. Could she be a hero heroine frustrated in that sense? Or could she be going mad? Now, that's not the kind of analysis that you would find in classical texts, classical interpretations, where they always went for the literal, the textual analysis of the text. All the great scholars of the 19th century, certainly the Germans, the Schlegel brothers in the beginning of the 19th century, oh my God, they went crazier than ever in trying to analyze these texts only in a pure textual point. Whereas later Germans of great distinction, like Ulrich von Wilamowitz Merlendorf, or indeed even Goethe, had actually attempted to analyze those texts in a different way, not just a textual way. Look at the grammar, look at the object, look at the indirect object, and decide what it was. Could it be that there were signs, something which is very fashionable now, after all, 1880, 1890, we have Freud, 1900, we have the beginning of psychiatry. Could it be that by now, the psychological interpretation of a text is perfectly acceptable in our time, not because it replaces the textual analysis, but because it gives you an added dimension in understanding the woman or the man in question. How can I build that theory? Slender evidence. But before we even go to Euripides, who was the great forerunner for what today we would call a psychological or psychiatric analysis of a protagonist. Before we go to him, we have one wonderful line, line 10, from Sophocles' Antigone, when Ismini appears, and she's asked, how is your sister? And she says, she is going mad, but she doesn't use the word mad. She says, kalhenusa. How many of you have heard that word? Perhaps not many. Kalhi is the noun, which means purple, dark red. Kalheno is the verb, very rare, and kalheno says the participle. She is, how do they translate it in English text? Look it up. Disturbed, worried. No. The analysis, which starts from Homer, who's the first who uses the word, is absolutely riveting in the fact that it has all sorts of clues worth pursuing further. For example, it is studied. Greece is an island, country, a sea country, near the sea. Metaphors concerning the sea are always appearing in Greek literature. And they discover that there are little microorganisms at the bottom of the water. When the water begins to become disturbed, just before a storm, what the Greeks call fusco thalassia, a swell, but not a storm. Very, very careful in describing. Where these little living creatures come from the bottom up to the surface and give a different color to the surface of the water, which is purple, red, blood. So, what's happening with Andigoni? Her character is disturbed. She's not yet mad, but she's going that way. And the fact is that, and this is really what's so fascinating, the cause of the changing of the color of the water is something which is at the bottom of the sea, which comes to the surface. The cause of her becoming bad may be something which is at the bottom of her subconscious, which is coming up to the conscious and gradually making her mad. 
Does it fit in? Maybe yes, maybe not. Is it different from the others? Yes, it is. Is it wrong? Well, I think it's arguable. And I think many have begun arguing it because it's absolutely intriguing and it's modern. And you know what? It really shows what a fantastic writer Aeschylus was. Because you know, the tragedies in those days were only 1,600 verses. Tiny little book, 1,600 lines. And what would he have? Line 10, blood, Antigone, disaster, death. Line 1436, and what we have? Hermon, her lover, her fiancé, the son of Creon, who can no longer marry her because she's gone, locked herself in uh, her cell and committed suicide, runs there to join her. He finds her dead, hanging, so he slits his throat and red drops of blood spill from his throat on to her white cheeks. In those days, they didn't write with computers. In those days, they didn't sort of highlight, move the text, change it and correct it. Somebody had thought of that text very carefully before he started scratching with a stylus, as it was called, on a piece of wood with wax. Such an amazing planning that starts and ends with the love story, the frustrated love story, with blood, with Antigone. Antigone, the hero, Antigone, the saint, Antigone, who's mad? I don't know. Let's look further because those Greeks are doing it all the time. And that means that they're giving us the opportunity to look at these texts and come up with different interpretations. I have another uh, picture here of an amazing character. This is Vanessa Redgrave. They tried to age her, but even trying to age her, she still looks good looking. She did of Hecuba. Hecuba is the queen of Troy. She's a marvelous, majestic figure. She is the epitome of misfortune in life and how misfortune in life piles on. And finally, you can't bear it any longer and you crack. She's exiled with her daughter, Polyxena, and she thinks her son, Polydorus, is somewhere there too, in Thrace. Why? Oh my God, those Greeks are so modern. They are so clever. They have foretold everything that happens in modern politics. So what happens? Priamus can see that the end of Troy is coming. The end of Troy means that he's stopped going to be a king and he will lose his money. So what does he do? He sends his money to <laughs> Except that it wasn't Geneva. It was Thrace. Because the person who ran Thrace was Polymestor, an old friend. But Troy collapses and Priam is killed. And the banker, the banker, the friend, says, well, if he's dead, I might as well take up the goal that he left me to look after. And what about the boy? The boy, I'll kill him. And he kills Polydorus and throws Polydorus into the sea. And you know what? Another amazing example, because it's not the only one, for those of you who in doing comparative literature where Shakespeare and an ancient scholar come up with exactly the same idea. Orestes and Hamlet, I could take hours to explain and discuss in detail, are remarkably similar and went through a remarkably similar number of drafts before it ended up the way you have it now. But Polydorus, amazing. It's the only example of a play which starts with a ghost on the stage. A ghost that says that I was killed 
And if you want justice to be done, take revenge. That's how the play starts. It's the only ancient Greek play where the ghost appears at the beginning of Polytheros. So we move, scene, to the Greek army. They're described by Euripides as a mob, ungoverned and ungovernable. You don't find in classic poets such brutal treatment of their own heroes. But the Greeks of that time, not now, had the guts to do just that. The Greek army is a mob. They have to be appeased. They are despaired. They have no money. They are defeated. They can't go back to their country. So what do they have to do? They want blood. And what blood? Achilles ghost appears and says, kill this young girl. A balance. The war against Troy couldn't start without the sacrifice of Iphigenia. The war can't end without the sacrifice of another Greek princess so that the wind returns and the Greeks can return back home. Who leads the mob to decide to kill the innocent girl? Odysseus. Another description of Odysseus, which is absolutely scathing. Homerus, Homer, describes him as polymichanos, a word that's extremely, extremely difficult to translate in English. But I think the essence is that whatever he decides to do, for good or bad reason, in the end he usually succeeds, and that's really what it's all about. But he's a cad. Yes, he is a cad. And it's clear from the way Euripides describes him that he's a cad. And he goes to Hecuba and says, you know what? I'm sorry, but we have to sacrifice your daughter. And then Hecuba also discovers that her son has died. One drama after the other. The woman cracks. The sacrifice of Polyxena is one of the most beautiful moments in any Greek tragedy. She decides to do it for her country. She's going to be sacrificed, I killed, by Neoptolemus, who's the son of Achilles, who killed her brother, Hector. So she goes there, and the army is waiting, and there's a scene that if you haven't, you may take her up and read it because it's amazing where she tears off the top of her dress and exposes her bosoms. And she said, be a man, hit me here, kill me, finish, I'm ready to die. I don't want to live as a slave of the Greeks. And the Greek is lost. And in the end, he does the usual thing. He just slits her throat. And as she is, she takes care to collapse, bleeding. It's all described in detail. She takes care to collapse, covering, making sure that she's not exposed. Well, Hecuba can't take that. So what happens after that? After that, we have Hecuba decides to take her revenge. And the revenge is to invite uh, Polymestor to come to her tent and arranges with the assistance of Agamemnon to kill his children and blind him. It's a ferocious act, again, described in great detail. And the question is, in later years, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, the moralists, the Victorians, the Enlightenment period, all those authors just couldn't understand it, couldn't stomach that, how horrible this woman was. How could she behave in that way? Euripides and Hecuba went into decline. Hecuba and Media were the two plays that were translated and kept alive more than any other play during the Byzantine period and the Renaissance, but not now. The moralistic 18th, 19th Victorian era means that Hecuba has to be condemned. And proof of it, they say, is a little phrase, 1149, 1150, 
where a seer from Thrace says, you dreadful woman, you'll have a terrible end. You will become a dog, a bitch. And you will climb the mast of Odysseus' ship and from there jump into the water and drown because you're a disgraceful woman. And of course the writers, the academics, always loving something fashionable rather than daring to challenge orthodoxy. What do they do? They say, there is the proof. Euripides is condemning her. He didn't like her. He describes her as a bitch who ends up drowning in the river. No. Euripides has done his work very carefully. She's buried in a place called Kinosima. And that place exists existed then and exists now. It's just opposite Chanakale on the Hellespont, but on the Greek side of the Hellespont, where the rocks were dangerous for navigation, where there was a need for a lighthouse. And that's why Euripides describes her and says that she's going to die as a dog with fiery eyes. But he doesn't say fiery eyes. The translators get it wrong. She doesn't say piros. He says pirsos. The dog will have torches shining over the dangerous rock and protecting future mariners. As subsequent professors who have read this carefully prove Euripides is not saying that she's got a shrine as a goddess, but at least the way she's buried marks that to the end this woman performed a useful task. Now, I'm taking a lot of time taking you through these details, but why? Here are three examples of a, a tragic poetry. Three famous characters who can be interpreted in so many different ways. And I don't think it's a mistake or a fault or a weakness on the part of the author, the opposite. If there's enough material there to support, as it has done, interesting interpretations. Interpretations which allow you to bring the text in line with changed morality and changed aesthetic tastes. The best example of that is in the Phèdre, which is the French version, 16th century French version of uh, Hippolytus. Now, Hippolytus is an amazing story. It's the only one that gave first prize to Euripides. But it's an amazing story. It's about a queen, Phèdre, who's oversexed, in love with her stepson who's undersexed. She wants sex, he doesn't. And why should he? His mother, Hippolyta, was raped by his father. His mother, Hippolyta, was then killed by his father. His mother-in-law wants to make love to him, and he doesn't want to do that. The plot develops, and in the Greek version, it's an amazing example of psychological exercise. No English translation has rendered the famous soliloquy of in Trezina accurately, which is nothing except plain, obvious, sexually expressed desire for the boy using absolutely, amazingly blunt language. It's all concealed. And yet that's what she is. And what happens? A thousand years later, Racine comes and does a classic. It's called Phèdre. It's not Hippolyte Phèdre. It will begin with both. But it ended up as Phèdre. And all the psychological removed by Racine, who was an extremely 
extremely meticulous scholar because he wrote notes and we have his notes. Notes are colored. Red means he agrees. Blue, he has to check it. Black means something else. It exists. They've been edited. And what do they show? They show that I can't write a French version where the prince of France, Hippolytus, the prince of Athens, is homosexual and doesn't like women. I can't write a thing like that. That's a scandal. It has to change. It does change. Phèdre, which is a classic piece, beautiful French, is an amazing piece. And it's a love passion between Phèdre and another girl that's invented to give passion between two women for the heart of Hippolytus. So what I'm telling you is we have amazing richness in these texts. I am running out of time, but I would have been very tempted because I see you remain, but despite my wish and help, you remain a quiet audience, probably you've fallen asleep, I suppose. Or if not asleep, you're numbed, you're tired, you're bored. So let me ask you one question because you're all a very learned audience. What's your view about media? Is anyone in favor or against her? Media? Any views? Such a... Say that again? Yeah, I, well, that's a... Now, that's a very interesting answer. And tell me what you mean by in that situation. No, I don't know. I, I, want, I want to hear from you what you have in mind. Because you have a very active mind, but I want to... I mean, when you read the news, I came on the news, you get stuff like that, you know, like mothers came their children, like the grandchildren, against their husband and stuff like that. I mean, more than times now. So... Well, it could take a long part of this lecture. But she asks, Jason, are you leaving me because there's another woman? No, he says. Are you leaving me because you want to have sex with another woman? He says. Why are you leaving me? Because the wife I want to marry is the daughter of the king Creon of Corinth, and he has no son, so if I marry her, I will be the next. There's no erotic, there's no female, there's no nothing. She is in a very complicated case. But you know why I think you're right in raising this doubt? And it hasn't been raised. If she is bad, as most of you think she is, and of course there's ample evidence that, I mean, what stronger argument except that the famous line, 18, uh, 1080, my anger is bigger, greater, my reasoning pass. I'm going to kill those children. But why? Why? You know why? Sorry? She was betrayed, what, sexually? No, 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 no. If you analyze the play very clearly, you will see that the main reason why she's doing all that is because Jason, by abandoning her, he's making her a citizen of no country, she has nowhere to go, she has no refuge to go, and she completely loses her status. She can't go back to Colchis because she's betrayed her father. She can't go back to Iolkos because she killed the relatives of Jason. She can only go to Athens because she's tricked her years. So it's an amazing play. If you read it carefully, you can't jump with confidence to one answer instead of another. What he's faced with is something absolutely remarkable, which is what? Here is a murderess. Here is a murderess, and yet there isn't a single reference to the Furies. He said in years. The Furies, as you know, the central part in Orestia and so on, always appeared if they had been murdered in the family and sought revenge for that. Not a single reference. Two, you have a speech, the first speech, that um, 
uh, Medea makes, which is in favor of women. She says, I'd far rather fight with a shield and a sword than go through the pains of birth. Men think that they go through terrible things, but women go through even greater hardship in life. She's a feminist. And you know what else, which is absolutely amazing? She is a woman who is absolutely determined to do justice in this case, and her husband is committing injustice by abandoning her. Why? Because their marriage was according to barbarian law. They slit their hands and changed blood. It was not according to Greek law. And their marriage was based on the idea of equality, which now the husband was betraying. Proof of it. The one and only example that you have in Greek tragedy. Tell me if I'm wrong, and tell me if I'm wrong, which drama says the opposite, where woman murderers leaves the scene by standing on the Theologion, the place which was reserved only for gods at the end of a tragedy from where the gods would administer justice. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. And you know why it's so important? Because again, what Euripides and others are trying to do is not to tell you you're good, you're bad. That's secondary. The main thing is for you to learn to analyze, for you to read the text, for you to form your own opinion. The dream that every teacher has about his students. I'm a politician. I'm asking you to vote for me, God knows for what reason. I'm a lawyer. I'm asking you to vote for me because I want to win the case. But I'm a teacher, and I'm a teacher not because I want to vote you to vote for me, because I want you to reflect on what I told you. At the end of the day, you say, I'm fine, come back, write to me. You'll find my address if you want, and you'll point out my and I will write back and tell you, you're right. Or maybe I will say you're wrong. But it doesn't matter. What really matters is that you thought about it. Now, what I want to do now is to move to poetry, lyrical about nature in particular. I want to show you something else, which is, I think, a fascinating thing. The idea of uh, uh, dovetailing, dovetailing of ideas, of images, of scenes. In a poem, the Bacche, written by Euripides in the 6th century BC, the last work of his, not 6th century, I beg your pardon, 406 BC, the Vakhe, which is about the new god, and Beethoven, the 6th symphony, the pastoral symphony. I want to play two bits, because this is an exercise which I think is important. The idea, if you want to understand the afterlife of a culture, an idea, civilization, or whatever, or play, you must be able to make these mental jumps and see to what extent A can be combined with B, even if it's separated by 1,200 years, even if one is expressed through words, poetry, is expressed through music. Could we have, Mr. Manol is here, invaluable, could we have the first part of an symphony which you know very well. Fourth movement, no, 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 second movement of the sixth symphony, the pastoral symphony. The scene by the brook as Beethoven himself wrote on the text. And it's introduced, this is the end of it, by strings, two strings playing slowly and in a muted way to illustrate the movement of water. And the rest are playing pizzicato to reflect the light in the water. 
and then all of a sudden it finishes this way. You have the birds. You have the singing of the birds. Listen to the first one. If it plays. Do you think What bird is that? No, the nightingale. And it's very important, Beethoven has actually written it. And it's very, very important because what you have here is this calmness of nature, this beautiful scene, and the birds singing, and it's nightingale. Because for Beethoven, it had no particular significance, except that for the ancient Greeks, the nightingale was a funereal bird. It only sang at funerals and in places of that kind, a lamentation bird. In other words, it's a sign that something terrible is going to happen, not the end of that beautiful piece. Just hold there for a second. Why? Because this bit is completely duplicated at the beginning of the song of Pentheus, who's the king of Thebes, who goes up to the mountain to inspire to see what they're doing and to kill them because he's not prepared to accept Dionysus. And here is his text translated in English. By the way, the, the, the old texts of that period are really extremely difficult to do. So forgive for the translation. When we had left behind the farms of this Theban land and cross us across waters, we started to strike into the foothills of Kitheron. Pentheus and I and the stranger. The stranger is Dionysus, who's disguised and who's waiting to get his revenge. First we sat down in a grassy glade, making sure no sound came from our feet or tongues so that we might see without being seen. A ravine bound with cliffs lay there, with pines casting their shadow over the stream that flowed slowly through it. Then the maenads were sitting, and we saw them, their hands employed in pleasant tasks. Some of them were restoring to a worn-out wand its crown of ivy locks. Others, with the joy of young mares released from the painted yoke, were singing Bacchic antiphonies. Nightingales, along with other birds, were singing their usual lamentation. It's remarkably similar, remarkably calm. Nature at its most beautiful, except for one mistake that he doesn't know. By the way, that concert was on the 22nd of December 1808, when for the first time the Sixth Symphony and the Fifth Symphony were performed together. It's the only example of two great symphonies of Beethoven being performed together. And you have that scene, and you have another note by Beethoven there. And he says, this is a symphony, the Sixth Symphony, unlike the Fifth. This is a, symph this is a symphony, not about images, but about feelings, about feelings. And then, the Maynard sudden tree, a huge big tree, is king who's after them, who hates them. And what do they do? Wait a minute, let me give the people the hear, the audience, the facts, and then you listen to the music. They go, they surround this big tree, all these women, mad, crazy, shaking the tree to a point where <coughs> Pentheus in the end falls down. And when he falls down, his mother, Agave, who is intoxicated, attacks him and decapitates him. And it's described in dreadful detail. And then, holding the, ha the head, the decapitated head, she rushes into Thebes and shows the head of a lion that she killed. And her father, the founder of Thebes, comes out and tells her, Pevimo, Iremis, 
squatters, etc. And gradually she calms down and realizes what she's done. And the story. Listen to the music. You'd never have an example of a storm in music like this, to my knowledge. And if you follow the sounds, the wind, it starts just with rain. <coughs> you even have, as you'll see, the decapitation. What happens in this play is almost the exact modern equivalent of jihadist. You have a decapitation. It's shown, and it's the mother, and it's all because they're not accepting the new religion, Dionysus religion, which is telling people what? And this is the important and historical explanation of this play. That Athens is defeated. The 30-year war with Peloponnese has destroyed Greece, destroyed democracy, de destroyed religion, destroyed the schools, destroyed morality. None of that is there any longer. Women are wandering around, refugees in Greece. Aristophanes talks about them. So does Euripides without the protection of men, without the protection of husbands. Children are wandering around. Athens, democracy suspended. There's such a general destruction of society that the new religion comes and the new religion offers to its followers what? Come, get drunk, misbehave, dance all day, sleep, and the next day the same thing. And Tiresias at one stage says, but that's not a remedy. You get drunk, the next more drinking. No solution. Society is going down. It is an amazing example of a society in decay. And who says that? I? No. I don't count for anything. But I know he does who came to Greece in 1955 and gave a lecture, which very few people have read, and he said that Euripides is very relevant a society is going through a period of crisis and one world is dying and the other one has emerged. That's the value of those things in educational terms. That's the beauty of those things. And that is the training side which is so exciting. At a time when people are not interested in classics and so on, you have to find a way to excite and interest young people, to make them think, to give them the traditional play in a way that makes sense, is very modern. They know the problem of escaping society. They know the problem of refugees. We know it. No, actually we don't, because we haven't yet woken up to the problem, because we, in totality, not the Greeks, Europe, were un at the time. Now, I want to go to a very different kind of poet, because I don't have enough time to talk about Sappho and lesbian love. Very easy to misunderstand very difficult to understand. But you know what? Sappho is very difficult to read. It's written in Aeolian Greek. 
A thousand lines survive out of the estimated 10,000 lines. How many lines would you say are devoted to lesbian love, to cause reaction, shock, revulsion? How many? Less than 10%. How many times does she refer to a part of the body to show a part of a body, which you see all the time in every newspaper? A string bikini or a, I don't know what, a, or whatever. Never. You know what she's always talking about, about her friend who she's in love with, an actoria? Ankles. Nothing else. Her ankles. And the poem? 70% in words. They're only extracts. 70% of the words are dedicated to nature. The beauty of nature. The simplicity of nature. The simplicity of simple, pure, innocent love. Now, look what I was telling you before. And I don't need one hour, but I need 10, 3, 20, 100 hours. You can't last it, but I can because I'm getting excited. And I must get excited because if I don't get excited, you will never get the message. You will never understand the beauty of these marvelous texts. And what's she doing? Just a few words. Wind. Near the sea. It's dark night. Just the moon. And she's dreaming of the wind that's blowing through the forests of Lesbos. And an actor is on the other side. And she says, she must be looking at it also and thinking of me. What bliss. It is beautiful. It is beautiful. And it's amazing because it's done with the use of eight words. Do you want proof of that? Yes. Another man, another man, another man without any prejudice in advance saw the beauty of that. And he did his own version 1,200 years later or more in music, using notes, not words. I apologize because technically this song, because of the different use of computers, will not come out perfectly. But let's play the one which is after because you really must see a practical illustration of what I'm just telling you. The ability of dovetailing different people, different medium, different eras, but describing the same feelings and images. Uh, not that. The marriage of Figaro. Zefiretto.
Wat moet je? Apologies. Oh. Evlogisate ke egida besos. I think it's beautiful. And it's by the same kind of man as Euripides was. Lonely, misunderstood, abandoned even by his wife who was his second choice, who didn't turn up at his funeral. Probably slightly mad all the evidence about his mother's side suggests that. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. But such a kind man. Such a man who had always defended in all his great operas, women. All the great, the Contessa in the marriage of Figaro. Or uh, Electra or Ilia, the Domineo Re di Creta, or Elvira in Don Giovanni. Always the protagonists, the leading roles, were women. Even the minx, the little naughty minx, the naughty little Serlina, is absolutely adorable in that unique song, Adiam, Adiam a bene, le pene di innocente amor. It is absolutely amazing. And you know what? He who was a Freemason, and Freemasonry at the time in Austria was dead against women because they hated Maria Teresa who had led huge campaigns against the Freemasons. He who was a Freemason gives equal status to man and woman in the Zauberflote. Tamino and Tamina. They say he was not a political figure. I don't know. But he was sensitive. He was ahead of his time. And he showed this remarkable similarity that another great man who had to leave Athens and go to Macedon in 408 because he was so unappreciated by the Athenians, Euripides. I will finish only with one text because I don't have time, because I want to pay tribute to the church and the archbishop. Love is a central theme with Aphrodite. Aphrodite was modeled on the goddess of love, the Phoenician love, but she's not known. Aphrodite is. And she appears in all sorts of forms. Lascivious, unfaithful. She has a child, Aeneas, and never looks after him six years of his life. A whore, a high-class whore, as the Aphrodite of Urbino by Titian, or a low-class whore, as of Manet. One kind of love that doesn't appear in ancient Greek tragedy is maternal love. And I think the best example comes from the church. And the best example comes from the representation of the Virgin and the Pieta. And the one thing 
The beauty of beauties, in my opinion, is Michelangelo's Pietà in St. Peter's. And what I'd like to do, but I can't find the text, is to read you, if I may, a note I rating at the time, which was a letter to my parents, because I had just graduated and gone abroad at their expense. And um, I went to the St. Peter's and saw it, and stood there and admired it, and admired it, and admired it, as I did, and cried, having lost the ability of crying when I stood at the Omphalion, in Hagia Sophia, which is a simple round circle where the Byzantine emperors were crowned. Nothing else, just a round circle. And I wrote this letter to them. I don't think it's a work of art, but nevertheless, this is what I wrote, and it's part of my own life. How do you describe the Pieta? How, having read as many books and articles as I could find over the years, thousands that pass before this monument every day and their varied reactions must be a tribute to the sculptor who, through one work, can provoke such shades of a single emotion. To me, however, the problematic nature of the work affects my thinking differently. It pushes me out of a life built on reading, studying, reflecting, the life of a geek, into a frame of mind that makes me realize how art can make us think in a way we were never taught to do before. This way of thinking defies definition. Some might even call this praying. Not in the structured sense established churches want us to adopt. Praying that springs naturally from within when one is made fully conscious of the transience if not nothingness of life compared with the eternity of beauty created by some other force which we simply can never understand and which can work directly or through the mind and use of a chisel of a young man, barely 21. Is not that result or force that gave it shape what one can only describe as divine? That is one of the most beautiful parts, the contributions the church has made. And in my opinion, the other one, but I have no time to go into it, is the opposite of revenge, which is aphesis, not signomi, aphesis. Aphesis, which stems, as St. Paul tells us, from the words that apply to Jesus, of which the most beautiful Greek word is praotis. Thank you very much. Can I say it? The most amazing and uh, exciting evening <laughs> we had for a long time here. So thank, thank you. you very much uh, for this beautiful presentation. And um, 
would you like? Can you take some questions? If there are any questions around? Do they feel like it? Do they feel like it? We could listen to you the whole evening. It's only an hour, so. There is one question. Thank you very much for your exceptional lecture. Uh, I'm not an expert on classical music, but uh, Mozart has also written operas dedicated to the Turks in a very positive light. What I never understood, how it, it is possible for people to uh, wax lyrical about ancient Greece, but then not being able to see the uh, oppressive, to say the least, uh, occupation by the Turks. Is it because, I mean, couldn't Mozart realize that uh, these people were responsible for the destruction, basically, of ancient Greece? Is it because Byzantium has been ignored as an extremely important part of our civilization, therefore there is no continuity? So we view ancient Greece the, the way I view Sumerians, Babylonians, as something really, really far away? Thank you. If you do so. What, uh, what exactly would you like me to try and answer? Your opinion, if it is possible. Your opinion is highly respectable. It's just me, rather exhausted your at the end. And I would like to know how it is possible for somebody to wax lyrical about ancient Greece and at the same time to remain silent or also eulogize about uh, uh, what basically destroyed the continuity of Greece, that is the Turkish occupation. And Mozart, uh, it's not only Rondo alla Turca, but many other works of him are dedicated in a very positive light to the Turks. Yes, uh, for, a, for a moment I thought you were about to accuse of uh, uh, not saying anything about what's happened uh, in recent times. I'm pleased that uh, I, I, I asked you to say your question again, and I understand that you're attacking me, but... Uh, Mozart doesn't need a defense, but let me tell you quite easily why. Uh, Mozart, while he was still alive, Vienna was being subjected to a, um, uh, the third or the fourth or the last, at any rate, siege that took place. And at that time, things that were Turkish and Oriental were very fashionable. Uh, and um, I think, you know, the, the piece, the a la Turca, or whatever you said, is an example uh, of music like that. But I think uh, you can see the good side of Mozart, i.e. the man who's tolerant and who uh, accepts that there's good, even on the other side, even on another religion, even on a political issue, uh, uh, becomes quite obvious in the Einführung aus dem Sarai. And there, what you have is a sultan, who at the end turns out to be good-spirited and lets the girl go with her real love. You could call that hypocritical, but I think it was quite remarkable at the time. And I think it is quite remarkable for all of us. Hold them strongly. But at the same time, to a discussion and to be open to the possibility that the side may have an argument or it's not properly presented or we haven't understood it. So I think it would be taking the Mozart idea of holding the Turks responsible for destroying Byzantium and so on on the basis of a small piece like Ala Turca uh, is uh, to me a little bit exaggerated, I would have thought. Uh, and uh, uh, I, 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 I still think that uh, the uh, real problem with the collapse of Byzantium, if you want to go into it in, in, in greater detail, rather than superficially, um, is uh, a problem that plagues Greece to this day, internal divisions. Uh, the decline of Byzantium began around Constantine Monomachus, 1145. 
And the patriarch, who was a very powerful man, uh, Kirularius, was the one who started the schism with the Pope's representative acting on behalf of the Pope, who had already died, and excommunicated the patriarch on Easter Day of 1045. That is a very complex issue, and it's a political issue. It's an issue as to who had the right to appoint the bishops in the new lands, particularly Serbia. Greeks were divided. In the end, Kirularios was murdered by the emperor himself. You can never forget that, too. You can never forget the fact that there were Byzantine emperors who, at an early stage, saw the emerging power of Islam and tried to diminish the reasons of conflict. Now, the emperor who had the guts to do that, and he was a great emperor without any doubt, but is misunderstood, is Leo III, the Isaurian. And his battle against the icons could be seen in that light. He lost, and you had the restoration of the icons. And in any political or religious battle, whoever wins, wins, and the other is forgotten. But it was nevertheless an interesting attempt to try to remove at the early phase of Byzantium, when Islam was not yet the danger that it was, uh, a point of disagreement over the icons in churches. Thirdly, you mentioned uh, the, or rather I did, the internal divisions. Remember that Byzantium started declining really and seriously after my namesake, Basil the Bulgarian Slayer. And the cause of the decline and the decay was the fact that you had an internal division which also replicated itself in Ottoman Turkey in the 19th century. What was that? The battle between the intellectuals who became the administrators in Constantinople, of whom the leader was one of the cleverest, brilliant, educated people Byzantium has ever had, but totally immoral, Pselos. And the Byzantine aristocracy, who operated in the provinces, who were soldiers, knights, la noblesse de paix, as they used to call them in Europe, but who nevertheless kept the invading Oriental forces of a Turkmen origin at bay until the fatal date of 1071, if I remember correctly, which is the Battle of Manzikerk. So you can add other reasons. One, of course, which is played upon these days frequently, but I think it's exaggerated, and I confess this, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, uh, is uh, the role that the Venetians uh, did in 12-4 by conquering Constantinople. It was an easy target, and they weakened Byzantium, but Byzantium was dying. Byzantium was dying because it couldn't modernize itself in the face of an emerging world, which I think the 13th and 14th century was. I've gone into history. I probably didn't convince you. And I apologize if I didn't. But I think there are different ways of looking at things. And learning, that is the only lesson I try to put forward. And learning that what's important most of all is to respect the views of others, whether you agree or not? Questions? Nobody else. Oh, there's a gentleman here. Um, uh, well, if there aren't any others, I thought that was an absolutely brilliant, a brilliant lecture. And um, one of the many interesting points you made was about the maternal love that emerges in Christianity that is not so present in. Greek culture and literature, but it struck me also in connection with your recalling of the iconoclasm that is revived briefly in Byzantium. But um, what the Christians do is seem to ignore the second commandment, which is iconoclastic against the making of images, 
and that creates a continuity with ancient Egypt. And maternal love is expressed iconographically in, in Isis, which used to be a good name, the goddess Isis, and her son Horus. And it's obvious that the Christians adopt that breastfeeding mother figure and the child <coughs> from ancient Egypt, ignoring the rule that you shouldn't have depictions of reality. I just wonder, and Herodotus um, is a Greek that acknowledges the indebtedness of, of Egyptian culture, but I just wondered whether you think that's sufficiently emphasized. Wonderful though Greek culture is, how indebted it may be to ancient Egypt. There is no doubt at all, uh, and Herodotus, who considered as a, uh, a story maker and uh, imaginative and not really reliable, is right in drawing a lot of parallels between Egypt and, uh, and, and ancient Greece. First of all, there was enormous trade. Uh, and you see that, for example, in all the relics and the statues and the pictures and the icons, the whatever it is in Santorini and other places like that, where you find monkeys, for example, which weren't indigenous to Santorini. Uh, so the trade was there. Uh, but I think, and, and, and Irolodos also goes a step further and gives us the uh, Egyptian names of the gods who were also known in Greece. Uh, the mother of Dionysus in the east is Kiveli, and in the west is uh, Ira, uh, or Semeli, you know, depending which view you take. Uh, so uh, the further back you go in history, uh, particularly as you approach the Neolithic period, 8th, 9th, 10th century earlier in Europe, you will find that all those deities and all those practices are pretty common in the most part of the Mediterranean world. Uh, whether uh, Egypt in particular was a uh, cause of influence uh, for Greece, I doubt. I think the Egyptian influence begins uh, with the Ptolemies, the succession of uh, uh, Alexander. I think the first three Ptolemies, uh, Soter and uh, I can't remember the name of the other two, uh, uh, represent a real continuation of the Alexandrian uh, tradition of bringing cultures together, uh, and they do. And hence, the tremendous success, the wealth of culture, mathematics, physics, science, uh, in, in, in Alexandria, and indeed in poetry. And indeed, a step further than that, because they are the ones who bring in the bucolic poetry and have an enormous influence on the Romans who continue the work that was started by the, the Alexandrine uh, bucolic poets. So I'm not quite giving you an answer because I think you phrased it in a wide way. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how I could phrase my answer in a more concrete way. I think the period of influence of Egypt, both for Greece but particularly for Rome, is 250 to 150 BC. But otherwise, thank you very much for your compliment. <laughs> thank you so much again for a wonderful